is to not lose your lose your purpose. I have seen a lot of people who come into college and they just forget why they came to college. You came to college to be a basketball player, not go to parties, not to fail, stuff like that. So don't ever forget your purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Benchmark. They're speaking the facts that you want to hear. The repertoire the vision is clear. Diamonds glisten like a chandelier. You know what I'm here for, like Michelle Lynch. It clutch time, we do not flinch. Real brothers, we do not switch. Hit home runs with the right pitch. Who run the city? What to do when they're hating on you? I feel like Kobe 2010. Taking an L, all I need is a win. This is his business, you know how they go. You're playing the seats, now it's on the ground. Tune in now, gotta be in the know. Showtime, bitch, my butter blow. Woo! I yeah welcome back welcome back to another episode of the bench mob ent podcast today we got on nazir owens on the show how you doing today i'm doing good i'm doing good Thank you. Appreciate you for taking time out of your schedule to hop on with us. Y'all know the house rules. Make sure you follow, like, subscribe on all streaming platforms and YouTube. We're going to get straight into it. How far back does your love for the game of basketball go? Like, did this start as five, six? Like, when did this love for basketball start? For you? I would say it started probably like around five. Um, the reason it started, my father is crazy because my father introduced me to 2K, and that's how I originally started getting into basketball and stuff like that. But yeah, my love go way back, like way back. What about the sport of basketball drew you to it that caused you to love the, the game? So it was a, it was, let me say not an event, but it was a situation that happened. So pretty much I tried out for this basketball team in the fourth grade. And I thought I did pretty good, but I didn't make the team. And I remember going home to my mother and I cried. And I was like, you know what? That's the last team I get cut from. And just like trying to get better. I just fell in love with the grind. And then later on, I started falling in love with the competitiveness of the sport. And but really it was the grind. I fell in love with the grind a lot. That's that's dope to hear because a lot of people don't fall in love with the grind aspect, especially that early. So yeah. to fall in love with the grind and then have that work ethic that early, it puts you in a position where you at now. It makes yeah, it, it just make like complete. just my well, fault for cut you off, but it just it just shows me like seeing where I was before and just seeing how better I got over time. That's what really I fell in love with. So falling in love with the grind from fourth grade, you grind and you putting the work in. Who were some people that you watch, like some players that you watch? that you looked up to and that you tried to mold your game after? I'm not going to lie. The one play, it was only one player. It was Kyrie, you know, Jordy, mm -hmm. Jer Jersey native. I just felt this though, because growing up, I wasn't athletic. I was kind of quick, but I was never like athletic or super tall. So I was like, you know what? I want to be able to cross everybody up and finish at the rack like Kyrie. Then I started noticing later on, you know, he got a post game. He got a great left hand great shooter but it was really like Kyrie and that's who I really watched a lot hey that's the most skilled basketball player yeah like the most I feel as though he's the best point guard in my opinion I feel like he's better than Curry I feel like he's better than every point guard in my opinion all time or like no, not all time just five. and if he's available and playing he could be the best point guard in the league that's the thing. If he's available playing, that's that's yeah, a ticket. You paying. Yeah. That's a ticket you paying to see. Yeah. Now, in your process, you playing high school ball, college ball. You're at college. You end up getting a you know a major knee injury. How was that process for you? Like to have that knee injury, and like what was the most difficult thing during that time? And like how did you get through the the rehab process? Because watching the greats, Kobe and all, they said that rehab is the, the like, the hardest actual part. So, like, what yeah. kept you motivated? So, pretty much uh, June 21st, I played in a in a summer league game for my school or whatever. 
And prior to that, like probably like two games before I had took like a weird landing where like my knee bent inwards and it was almost like, I don't know, it was weird. I just got up and I kind of limped off, but I felt fine. So June 21st, like literally five minutes into the game, I came down, jump stop, and just felt my knee pop like immediately. And I remember sitting there and it was just a pain that I never felt before. Usually I'm the type of player, I get hurt. I'm going I'm to play through it. I couldn't get up. I couldn't walk. I was just sitting there on the ground. And it felt like I was going to pass out because the only thing I was replaying in my head was me missing the upcoming season. I had a lot of goals set for me during that time. I had a lot of goals that I wanted to achieve. So I'm just sitting there, like, just scared. You know, I had people that was, like, very, you know, encouraging, saying, you know, just, you know, it's probably a hyperextension, sprained knee. But me, I already knew because I couldn't walk. So, you know, pretty much um, my friend Justin, thank you for him. But he took me to my um, high, my college trainer and he was doing like the little ACL test. But he couldn't tell because my knee had so much like fluid and it was swollen. So pretty much I got my MRI and that entire week I didn't go outside, didn't leave my room or anything. I was just waiting for the call. I finally got the call that I tore my ACL. And I tore my medial meniscus mm. or whatever and i'm not i cried bad the first person i called was my mother i cried bad for a week straight because it was just like i had put in so much work for the mm. upcoming season because i had a great first year like the second year is gonna be my year just for all like it felt like the work just didn't make no point now so i would say the hardest thing about like recovery was early on knowing that you can't play basketball at all, knowing you're not going to be able to be on the court. And just like, just, it was just that though. Mentally, it was hard. The physical therapy process, it was hard like early on because my leg was locked in like one position and I couldn't move. Mm. So he would have to like force it because I lost all range of motion in my leg. So he have to force it. So I was in a lot of pain. But other than that, the physical therapy process wasn't really that bad but mentally early on it was like it was bad like being around basketball and it's hard for like when you play basketball every day it's hard to even you know dream of a day without basketball that's why now like now that I'm clear I would never regret I I'm not regret I would never like take anything for granted because you never know when you're not gonna be able to play again that day I didn't know that was gonna happen but the early on part like when I got sur the surgery was horrible it was the worst pain I ever felt in my life. That that was bad. Once the anesthesia wore off, it was horrible. Uh, after that, it kind of started getting easier, like dealing with weights, doing like it was like regular basketball workouts. But to me, mentally, it was just hard because you know being around basketball practice, being at some runs, you can't play. You want to play, you can't like do anything at all. But how I got through it. Really, I would watch like old basketball clips of myself just to mm. remind myself of who I was before I got hurt. Just so I know, like, I always had the confidence, you know, when I get back, I'm going to be the same or even better. I never had any doubt in that. But really, I had a great group of friends and like my mother kept me motivated just to keep going, you know, not to give up. But I was watching a bunch of like my college clips. I'm like, I can be that person again, pretty much. I could really be that person again, but it was it was hard. It was a lot of a lot of pain, a lot of depression, depression, and seeing when like high schoolers go through ACL or even NBA players and seeing how they say, "Oh, it's like really it's it's bad, it's it's bad. It's a mental game, not really that bad physically. You know, learning how to walk, run again, but it's bad because you're used to like doing. Cause I remember like the first two weeks after my surgery, I couldn't shower like correctly my knee was in so much pain so it's just the little things that you're used to doing you can't do that's mentally like it hurts pretty much hey man shout out to your mom shout out to the people in your support system because like you said the mental aspect people yeah. go through depression and sometimes i'm sure you've seen it some athlete that's like yo forget this like i don't even want to i don't want to play no more like i don't want to do it because it's so much of a toll on the mental and you go from playing every day to now you can't that's what one of somebody on K to the school. And he was like, I'm really like proud of you because you know, most people, you go through a significant injury like that, 
they don't even want to play no more because you're scared you're going to get hurt. And then the process, like nine to 12 months, they say I wouldn't get cleared till nine months or even 12 months. I got cleared in eight because I put in so much like work in like I put in a lot of work to get back to where I was. So like I understood like it's not going to be easy. And I just understood like I want to be able to play again and be at the best form. So yeah, that yeah, that I would never want to want this to happen again. From coming from high school, right? What was your recruiting process like? And could it have been any other school than St. Elizabeth? Like, was there any other school that you was considering? Like, you know what? I'm yeah. gonna go there. Uh, my recruiting process was kind of weird because I came. I'm a COVID kid, so my I graduated during the COVID year. So my high school recruiting process was like. Like I had schools, but the way like I went through a lot of tough times in high school, just a playing aspect because I played on a team with a bunch of other great players. So it was kind of hard for me to stand out, especially when you're in a system where you're kind of tall in high school and everybody else is short. So you have to play a bit like a big man position. And that, it sucked at the time because I already was a guard. Like I already had hand do. I was able to score, but he wanted me to play bigger because, you know, Right, so shorter, and I had other great players on my team that you know one of them went to Bloomfield College, he went to Division Two. They had other great players, so I wasn't able to fully showcase what I'm able to do. But um, I had Caldwell University D two, but I couldn't. Some some stuff happened. I couldn't go there. Ramapo College, but I felt as though if I was going to go to another school in the same like like if I was going with Division Three, I'm going to go there where I can go and play automatically. They was telling me they wanted me to wait till my junior year. I just had so much confidence in myself. Yeah, oh, right. Wow. That's the exact base I mean. I just had so much confidence in myself that I can come out and play automatically and just like that. I wouldn't advise any high schools to do that, but I just had so much confidence in myself. I felt as though I am not so much bench warmer. So I just felt as though, you know, I can go out and just perform. And I will never forget this day, um, decision day, May 1st. I was going through all of that. And when I saw everybody on Instagram, like, pretty much posting any decisions, I started crying. I was so upset because, like, what am I going to do? Mm. And I remember I'm just email. I email. I probably email over 35 coaches. I emailed a bunch of coaches. And I came across St. Elizabeth. Now, the one thing I did, I would research the, um, the players that's, like, in my position. And most of them was graduating. So I'm like, all right. You know, close to home, everybody's pretty much graduated. And I got in contact with one of the coaches, but he never emailed me back. And then one of my old high school assistant coaches, he knew the assistant coach up there. So that's how I really got connected with them. Hey, to your point though, betting on yourself is how it, how you have to do it. Cause that, you gotta take a risk. That's disgusting to hear. You talk, play my junior year, what the heck I'm yeah. doing the first, first two years, just practice squad. Like that makes, no sense. No, no sense in the recruiting process to even tell me that I'm not coming. Yeah. <laughs> Junior year, that makes yeah, that I'm like no man, I was like, if I play out of division three, I'm gonna go somewhere where they're gonna use me because I know I have a lot of skill and a lot of talent that I could bring to the team. So you're telling me, you know, oh, I'm gonna have to wait to this year. I'm like, you yeah, know. Nah. For you playing on that uh collegiate level, because a lot of people don't get that opportunity. Yeah. What would you say is the biggest difference between high school ball and college ball? Honestly, for me, it's more like in high school, I would say the competition level a little bit. It's probably two things that I notice is different, the competition level. So in high school, for instance, I don't want to say, but when we play like a certain team, we will know we're going to beat them just out of pure talent. We'll have just more talent than them. In college, especially, like, the conference I'm playing, you can't go in on that because you feel as though you're going to beat a team off of pure talent. No, because some of these college teams really scrap. They're really actually good. Their record might not show it, but they're really – they're talented. So the competition level is definitely different. Of course, size. Uh, and in college, we want – you run a lot of plays. High school, we know it's a lot of five out. Don't mm -hmm. run, really run a lot of plays. College, it's a set every time. Like, especially my team, we run a lot of plays and stuff like that. So that's why I feel like it's the difference. With you playing on a team that runs a lot of plays, do you feel 
teams like that to be actually successful, you have to have a high IQ to actually be able to run these plays and know where to go and know the ins and outs and know the counters and all of those. Yeah, so my first year of college, I pretty much I played the two, three, and the four. So I had to learn all this position. You have to have a certain type of IQ to play in college. Because I feel as though, like, if you don't have IQ, first of all, a college coach not going to really want to put you on a team. You can't remember plays. But in my opinion, I feel like running a play every time, it can, like, I don't know. You're not, I feel like you shouldn't do it all the time, especially, like, when the game is late. I feel like you got to have a couple hoopers in your team, like someone that can, you know, go get a bucket like that. But to to your point, I mean, yeah, you got to have a lot of IQ to, like, be able to remember plays, especially if you run different positions. Your coach now is Coach James Adams, right? Yes. I went to high school with him. How was it being coached by him? Uh, I'm not going to lie. It's kind of – I'm not going to say it's weird because I'm not used to a coach that's always cool, calm, and collected all the time. I'm used to, like, the yelling – you know, that type of coach. He's a very calm coach, very, I wouldn't say nonchalant, but he reminds me of myself because I'm a very nonchalant person. He's just very nonchalant in his ways. But he runs a set. He's a very defensive-minded person. And he really, because before, I'm not going to lie, I didn't take defense that serious. I'm a bucket getter. But he made me want to, like, you know, be able to play defense. When you're able to stop the person's best, like, best player, I mean, the team best player, and then go score on him, I just, I'm a troll, so I can troll off of that. I'm a big troll, so if I'm able to stop you and then score you and talk at the end, yeah, so he's a very, he's a cool coach, very calm, very cool, calm, and collected. He's just, I feel like he's a great coach. Yeah, James has been that way since, I think he's like two, three years before me he graduated. He's been like yeah. that since high school. Real yeah. laid back, cool dude. I'm happy for him that he has the coaching job. Couldn't be go to somebody more deserving than him like that. Yeah, I think that I think you need that that sometimes. Yeah, I think you need that sometimes though. Like some coaches will yell your face out. Yeah, some coaches are like James. Give me that like that Steve Kerr vibe. Like you know what? I'm a laid back. Very very laid back. Plays. Yeah yeah yeah. For you right now that you're playing on collegiate level, which you know is like two percent of all players from high school get to do that. What is one piece of advice you would give to somebody aspiring to play at that collegiate level? I have a couple of advice. So the first thing before it's not even basketball related, keep your grades up. The first thing you have to keep your grades up because if you come into college and, you know, your grades not right, especially like the first semester, if your grades not right, college don't play that. You know, high school, you know, they may be having some players that's failing, but they'll let them slide college. They, they're not playing that. They they is not playing that. And probably the second advice I would give is to not lose your lose your purpose. I have seen a lot of people come into college and they just forget why they came to college. You came to college to be a basketball player, not go to parties, not to fail, stuff like that. So don't ever forget your purpose. That's what I would say. You know? That's the that's the title of the episode right there. Don't forget your purpose. That. That's good because a lot of people, like you said, they they get there and lose focus of why I'm here. Like, yeah, why? Like, yeah, I have seen that a lot. They just lose focus. They want to go to parties. Oh, third one because this is big. You have to learn how to time manage. You have to learn. Hmm. My first year was I. I'm not a really. I'm not a partier. I don't really go to parties like that. I may go and chill. I don't drink. I don't smoke or anything. So, you know, you may have a. You may, it may be a party at 11 p.m., but you got a homework assignment due at 7. Which one do you want to choose? You have to do your assignment. The assignment might take long, so you have to choose between that. Same thing, road games, we don't get back till like, 11 p.m. You might have assignment due at 12 a.m. So you have to, like, really be able to time manage, know when to do your assignments, know when to party and when not to party. Just stay inside and stuff like that. Also put in the extra work at that. Those are all key pieces of advice um, for those that's watching, listening, take from it. That's some good wisdom and knowledge right there. We're going to end off the show with what we call the fourth quarter. It's the last segment and some fun questions, some things to get to know you outside of basketball. 
So for you, what is your go-to meal? What's your favorite thing to eat? My favorite thing to eat, chicken Alfredo. It's my favorite meal ever, chicken Alfredo. Chicken Alfredo, all right. Favorite things to do outside of basketball? Uh, go clothes shopping. I like shopping for clothes, shopping for sneakers. Uh, What else? Play video games a lot. My game is like on right now. I was just playing 2K. So yeah, I play I play a lot of video games. Yeah. Who would you say was wasn't on the list of questions, but being that you in the fashion, who would you say you think is the most fashionable NBA player? Who got the most swag? Shea Gilgis Alexander, by far. It's not even close. It's not even close. What about what about Shea's swag that you like? I'm cool with the look because he liked to throw on like the little baggy fits. But he makes it look nice. Like he he doesn't have on something where I can tell what that is. You know, I'm gonna go buy that. I don't know what he be wearing, but he be putting it on though. Like it just looks nice. He can wear it, he could pull off any fit. So you said you a troller, you like to be able to talk to him after you get the bucket and stop him. Who do you think is the best NBA troller trash talker right now? Hmm. When I think about troller. I would say I be hearing stuff about KD because it's like you really can't say anything to him. Like if he's talking, he's going to score on you regardless. Like he's going to shoot over you and, and he can get a stop. So I feel as though if someone starts with KD, he's going to talk and he's going to do his thing too. You're not going to be able to do anything about it. Yeah, I've watched a couple of his podcasts. He typically don't say nothing until somebody Some start, start talking and then, which ain't smart. Because Katie's 6'11", 7 feet tall. He is. It's not a, he, He's a guard and a center's body. That's the same thing with Luca too. Luca doesn't start anything, but once you start talking to him, Luca won't go. Straight Bucky. Yeah. Five artists that you have on your game day playlist. NBA Youngboy. Future. I don't know if a lot of people know who he is, but Lucky. I listen to Lucky a lot. Uh, little baby, and for the fifth one, baby face Ray. Baby face Ray. All right. So, if you had to choose one song that exemplifies your basketball career, what would that song be? Hmm. It would probably be "Little Baby Stand on It" because. I felt this though in that song, he's just talking about coming up and stuff like that. So I feel like I came up from a lot, coming from where I come from. You know, a lot of people, especially East Orange, New Jersey, a lot of people don't make it to, you know, the next level or whatever. So I just feel like he's talking about coming up and stuff like that. Before we get you out of here, you got some tax. What's your favorite tax and why? Which one is your favorite and why? Hmm. I would say it's my tat that I have my left shoulder. I have a I have two favorite tats actually. Mm -hmm. So I have one with my aunt, rest in peace her soul. Um she died due to leukemia in 2016. So that's my favorite tat right now. And the second tat I have self-made going down, down my arm. Mm -hmm. Because during high school, I was going through a lot where I just couldn't find my confidence with basketball. And like, I just had a lot going on with the whole basketball aspect in high school. So that was one tat that I got self-made. Just remember, you made yourself. I never needed any help. Because during that whole time, I never – I haven't worked out with a trainer so, until I got to college. I had no trainer. Mm. So I put that self-made going down. And the third tat, I got to get this one out. I put bet on me, like, a week after I got hurt. Because mm. I was here, like, a lot of people would be like, oh, like, do you think you would be – better when you come back do you think you're gonna be good I was like bro just bet on me I'm gonna be fine I'm gonna come back better than what I was before so those are my favorite three ties those were good tasks right there before we get we got the NBA stuff who's your MVP I want to say Joel and B I really want to but I feel like it's gonna to go to Jokic the only way it's gonna to go to Embiid is because of MVP fatigue if people don't want to see Jokic as the MVP, it's going to go to Embiid. But it really should go to Jokic. Jokic is putting up crazy numbers. You really can't do nothing with that. Nobody's doing what he's doing night in and night out. 
Who wins the East? Celtics. I don't think Bucks right now. I feel like Bucks. I wouldn't say they have an up and down season, but they're not having the season when they won the championship. It's not a season like that. I feel like Celtics is too hot right now, in my opinion. They have the best duo, duo in the league. We, do they got the best duo? I would say they got the second best duo. I don't think they better than the James Harden and Embiid, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. But Celtics too hot right now. Who wins the West? Uh, this is hard. Mm. I don't know. That one is probably who's number one in the West right now? Denver. I would say Denver will win the West. Grizzlies, I don't know the whole John Morant situation. Yeah. I'm a big John Morant fan, so when I heard that, I don't, I don't really know how that's gonna go. So I will say the, I will say the Nuggets. I will say the Nuggets. So then you have the Celtics beating the Nuggets in the finals. I don't think I have that finals matchup. I have the Celtics going to the finals, mm-hmm. but the Nuggets, I don't know. Personally, I feel like, and I'm a little biased, a little. I feel like the Lakers can pull out something to go to the finals. If you look at them, they have uh they have a great team. They're playing very well without LeBron. LeBron come back to that. Delo's playing great. Jared Vanderbilt's playing great. AD can play great when he's playing. He just like because it was some game, he had like eight points. I'm like, bro, what is he doing? And it's just like when he's playing 20 and 13. With Braun and everybody, Austin Reeves, they could be like they could be the, a lot of teams don't want to see the Lakers in the West. A lot of teams do not want to see them. I agree with you on that one. I'm a Lakers fan. I I can't wait for Braun to be back. He doesn't have the boot on right now. Say so he's back with the team. Take your time, Braun. This team, yeah. I think they got something special. Like to your point, they won that game that AD had eight points. I'm still looking at it like, why did bro? Why did you have? Eight points. <laughs> Come on, like I forgot man. what team they played, but the center wasn't. I forgot what team they played. I was watching the game. Like, why does eighty have eight points? And D'Lo start. Jared Vanderbilt had like sixteen. Uh, Rue had like I think ten off the bench. Like they just have a lot of pieces that a lot of teams really can compete with, especially in the West. I feel like the Nuggets. They're a great team, but I don't feel like I feel like they need like. They have Aaron Gordon, Jamal Murray, but they need like that, that solid, like a 20. I don't know. They just need another star, another one. MPJ, he's a good, he's good, but I don't, I don't feel like they got really what it takes to be in the finals. Grizzlies, they're just young. They're very young. They're missing a, they star John Morant. They not, I don't feel like they're not going to make it that far without him if he doesn't play. Warriors could be, I feel like we could see a Celtics versus Warriors rematch. Mm-hmm. I personally feel like, especially the way Curry and Clay is playing. Clay had like 33 yesterday in the first half. I was like, bro, eight threes, bro. I was like, bro, he's crazy. So and, I think, I think, like you said, I think it's really it's the Warriors, Lakers. Like one of those is going to uh, shock shock some teams because the Warriors are starting to look. You even had Iggy was balling yesterday. Yeah. Oh my god, they, they starting to come into into form, and the Lakers is just everything you just mentioned. So for you, before we get you out of the last one, we're going to have, like, who's your rookie of the year and who do you give defensive player of the year to? My rookie is Pablo. Paulo. It's is pretty much a given. He's taking – and it's crazy because every time I see the Magic play, bro, like, I just see the Magic play the Bulls. And I'm like, you know, the Bulls should win this game. Magic beat them. It, they just – they're. I want to say they're good now. But they have some great pieces for the future. Like they have a really good team. My defensive player of the year, uh, it's probably gonna go to Jaron Jackson. But I feel like Brooke Lopez makes a good point for this defensive player of the year. He makes a good Bro. point. Brooke Lopez people, is a great defender. People who don't are not paying attention. He's had like four or five games where he had like nine blocks and like. 17 exactly. rebounds, like Brooke Lopez. Because a lot of Giannis been in and out the lineup this season. Yeah. Brooke's been holding it down. Like that's one thing that scares me about the Bucks too. Giannis been he's been missing a lot of games more than usual, like more than I'm accustomed to him. 
missing. But yeah, Brooke Lopez makes a great case, but you know, more than like it's probably gonna go to Jaron Jackson the way it's looking. Probably, man. But yo, appreciate you taking time out with us. That's the end of this episode right here. You already know the vibes. If you stay ready, you don't gotta get ready. Bench mob ENT, we out. Peace.